Hi, and welcome to another Lorenzo's Music Podcast. I'm Tom Ray, and on today's show, I talk to an artist based out of Nashville by the name of John Worthy. John Worthy is a musician who releases his music under Creative Commons, but he also makes music for movies and for television and has recently become a full-time musician. He played out. We talk a bit about how he booked shows, his experiences with that. We talk about how he went from recording in studios to also recording at home. And he has a new album that's released that's out on Spotify and other services, but also was able to campaign to create a vinyl LP. So we talk about all this kind of stuff. We talk about music and just recording, songwriting, and it was a great conversation. I was happy I got to t uh, that I got to meet him. So here is that interview starting right now. My name is John Worthy. I am a musical artist, producer, songwriter, vocalist, um, engineer, just pretty much anything involving music I do. And uh, we're here to talk about music. Yeah. And also, where are you located right now? Nashville. So uh, how long have you lived there? It's been about 10 years. Oh, wow. Where did you move yeah. there from? So I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and oh. then I went to college at Penn State. And then as soon as I graduated, I moved to Nashville. Um, I was in a, a college band, and that's kind of where I fell in love with performing and senior year I didn't really have job plans necessarily so i the the singer of the band that i was in was like hey man i'm i think i'm gonna move to nashville and i was like yeah that sounds fun i've never been there so we we moved to nashville kind of sight on unseen and um yeah i've been here ever since so you weren't even the singer of this band no i just played guitar and then we wrote some of the songs i didn't really start singing like lead vocals or even my own songs until maybe halfway into my Nashville journey so far. Okay. Yeah. All right. And when you went there, um, I know that like on Spotify and all the other places you're labeled as John Worthy, but there's a band that you have with your name in it too. What was the progression from that to just using your name? What, what band? Is uh, it, is John it Worthy and the Benz. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I think I only did one album where I had that on there. But normally okay. when I play live, I just have, as opposed to just saying John Worthy, um, it's more inclusive to say and the Benz when I have a band up there with me. Okay. So I had John John Worthy and the Benz. And I think I had like a more solid lineup during that time. So I just kind of included them on the name for that, right. for that specific album. But it's they're all songs that I've written and um, – it's always kind of just been my thing. And then kind of whoever can play with me plays with me on the, on shows. Okay. And I was going to ask that if you have like a set backup band or if you just have musicians that you perform with, or at least I guess it would have to be a, a slew of musicians that you can call on to yeah. play with. Okay. Yeah. Over the years it's been, it's been more consistent at times. And then at other times it's just whoever can fill in. It's really hard, especially here everyone's playing with three or four different acts and has so much going on that it, it's really tough to lock down a singular band. Yeah. Um, so you kind of need like a whole roster of people that you can call on. Okay. And um, yeah, sometimes I have had, if you saw me in a couple of different cities, maybe I did have the same people, but the last two or three years, it's kind of just been whoever can play with me will play. Okay. Now, going back to you and the singer from your college band decided to go to Nashville. Now, yeah. that's a place where there are, let's just say you got some competition in that city. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's more than a few musicians and bands in that city. So what was it like first moving there and what did you do? Yeah, so we just did the the full band thing. Um I think I was totally naive to everything music, which really helped. I didn't oh. understand the competitiveness. I didn't understand how it really works. So really until, I mean, maybe even five years ago, I thought that music was just a band got together, wrote a song and then recorded it in a studio. I didn't understand that there were producers or engineers or 
all these other things. Like I, I had so? no idea. What do you mean? I mean, I just thought everything was a band or a group of musicians gets together and records the songs. Like I didn't, now I do a lot more pop stuff and like I make the whole song myself for people or for, for other various things. But I just thought okay. the whole industry was a band gets together, records songs and then puts it out. I didn't understand all the other things that go into it. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. You mean like so the self promotion, getting the word out there, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. Then just like you have a lot of solo artists that kind of just work with one producer and make a song. It's not always just a band. Um, I don't know if that, if that's making sense or not. Well, elaborate on that. How did you make this discovery? How did you, how did, when, how did this realization just, come about? Just kind of being in, engrossed into the music industry here, you know, getting more opportunities and seeing how recording actually works, seeing that there's all kinds of different artists. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm, I've never been one to like do a ton of research. So I kind of just dive into things as they happen. Okay. So just kind of experiencing Nashville and all that music had to offer kind of opened my eyes to the whole world of everything. Yeah. See, um, I guess my opinion or my, my way that I probably would have realized it, or at least my view of Nashville is that it seems much more like a live music town. So this, this insight that you had is kind of interesting because you're talking more about the, yes, you play live, but there's more to it that you do in the background to work up to other things is what it kind of right. sounds like to me. So I find that interesting. Yeah, I think it's getting to be a lot more, um, it's definitely a songwriting town. Yeah. And there's a lot of, a lot of producers here that just kind of help either make the demos or the, the final tracks that you hear on YouTube or Spotify. Mm -hmm. Um, I, myself, and I know a lot of other people do stuff for uh, TV and film. Mm. And so that's just the, me just kind of making tracks all by myself and doing all the instruments and stuff. Tell me about so, that. Uh, that's an interesting leap for a lot of musicians to make. And it's one yeah. where it's like, I mean, once you get there, I feel like musicians that do it are like, Oh, it was, you know, and now this is what I do. But others is it's, it's like people going, I could do voiceover work. And it's like, all I have to do is record my voice, but there's a part in the middle on how you go from having that idea to actually going, Oh, this worked. So tell yeah. me about doing music for TV and stuff like that. Yeah. So I was full on, just into the touring thing um, mm -hmm. in 2019 is that was my, the most shows I've played. I played over a hundred shows, all kind of DIY doing my own booking. And then I had a really good year planned for 2020. I had like 60 or 70 shows booked through August. And then of course uh, the pandemic hits and all my shows get canceled. So I kind of was left with this huge mm -hmm. void of time and, and not a whole lot of things to pursue with music. Yeah. And uh, my girlfriend, Kiki, she had been doing the sync thing for a number of years already, recording her own vocals. And oh, she really? kind of just suggested that maybe this is a good opportunity for you to start learning how to record yourself and just see where that goes since you have all this time. So I downloaded Ableton and hmm. started accumulating equipment and just kept going for it and going for it, making all these random songs that weren't very good and figuring <laughs> out how to get different sounds and different, you know, using EQ and compression and all that stuff. And eventually um, she was able to introduce me to some of the people that she had worked with in that mm -hmm. industry, TV and film. And um, I was able to send over some examples of stuff I had done and they asked me to, to make songs for a specific opportunity. And then, um, yeah, I've been doing that for the last two and a half years. What kind of stuff did you send over? Did you send over like, Oh, here are some songs I did, or were there like instrumentals that you go like, would, would they be asking for, we need this particular type of mood or, you yeah. know, what kind of stuff did you send? Just songs that I, I think I had already self produced and released a few songs of mine. Okay. Um, so I think I sent those and then I had been working with this artist in LA and we were kind of co-producing songs together just hmm. for random opportunities. If anything ever came up and those were kind of a good baseline as into what I could do. So okay. I sent those and then, um, yeah, like you said, they usually give you what's called a brief and it will have like examples of the lyrics, what they should be. Um, Oh really? 
two or three songs that it should sound like kind of a mood and a vibe and then very specific um, structure like intro verse pre chorus verse chorus bridge chorus they'll tell you how to lay out the song and you just kind of try and take all that and still be creative and craft the right. song. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was wondering if they give you something in mind or if it's like, we can add this to the library and maybe somebody will pick it later. But problem with that is, is that's like people telling you, um, we're not hiring right now, but we'll keep your resume on file. Yeah, and it's exactly. like, no, they're still going to put the ad out later and hire, <laughs> ask new people yeah. to come in. <laughs> yeah. So, all the, all the songs I've gotten placed, they pay me in advance. So they kind of know exactly what they want. Okay. Um, so I make it and then I get, you know, royalties on the back end if it does get placed. So okay. they, they're not just throwing songs willy nilly at the, at the board They're They have a very specific thing they want in mind. And then it's up to you to kind of make it a cool song. Do you have examples of some of the stuff that it's been used in or things in maybe even just interesting things? If you don't want to say that's perfectly fine too. I just, yeah, I, I don't mind at all. Um, okay. I mean, so reality TV uses a lot of background music. So some of the bigger yeah. stuff, yeah, they do. Um, the Kardashians, <laughs> um, selling sunset, American Ninja warrior. Oh, wow. Um, I like Let's that I, uh, Married American at first Ninja Sight. Warrior is the one that I went, oh, wow, to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, go continue. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, I, I could pull up my royalty statement. There's all kinds of random stuff on there of, right. of, of shows it's been used in. But um, and then I've just had a, I've also had been lucky and had a, a bunch of songs used by random videographers and filmmakers in some pretty cool projects, which has been nice. Um, one year, uh, a person from the, the European, uh, real estate company Seville's reached out and they were making yeah. a year end video for COVID and like the impact it's had on people and, and trying to manage their, their finances. So they used one of my songs, which is really cool. And, yeah. um, I've had different like travel vloggers use my music, mm -hmm. um, couple of different people have made music videos out of my songs, short films. Nice. So now yeah. when people are contacting you, are they contacting you because of who you're releasing these songs through or are they contacting you personally or both? The random stuff like the bloggers, the real estate company, the music videos, that's just a happenstance. Like they heard my song and they okay. want to create something with it. Um, the sync opportunities usually are very, you know, from a specific company. So they're, they know what they're getting into. And this is the company that uh, your girlfriend introduced you to. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. And see, that's one of those things where it's and, and this always seems to be the answer. It's always somebody knew somebody that knew someone that said, you should submit something here. And it's, Oh, right. I, I need to know somebody that knows somebody to try and get some yeah. stuff where I want it to go is what it amounts to. <laughs> I feel like that's, I mean, not even just music, but every yeah. opportunity in life is just, you know, it's who you know, uh, and, and you have to be ready and, and well suited to, to fit the opportunity when it does come. But most things happen just because you have to know someone or someone right. introduced you. And do you need to be represented to submit music like this? Or is that what they're doing is you're asking them to represent you, I guess. I yeah, guess I don't know what happens the after ones, that. They're the ones with the relationships. Gotcha. With like okay. Netflix and all them. All right. um, so they're the intermediary that's connecting the music to the show. So I'm not wrong then when I was thinking when I first started hearing your music that I'm like, I swear to God, I've heard this somewhere before. So it's very possible that I've heard it somewhere before. Yeah, you could have. Okay. All right. Yeah. That's, that's actually kind of interesting. Now, in, another question too, because uh, my band is actually a Creative Commons band. And I yeah. know in the past and possibly currently, you've released music under Creative Commons. Now, is that something you did for, like, were you kind of doing it because you thought it was an interesting concept or it was just something like you tried it out once? I've talked to many musicians I've met who have released under that. And some of them were just like, Oh, I just thought it sounded cool. So I checked the box on Bandcamp, which is perfectly yeah. fine. But I was just wondering if you were doing it for a reason, or if that was also the case, like you were just releasing it. Cause it sounded like a interesting idea. I think it started. Um, and I saw we have a mutual contact color. 
Mm-hmm. I don't know if and you he lives in Milwaukee, so you probably know him. He's yeah, he's in he's Milwaukee and I'm in Madison. I yeah. played I played a show with him. We've only been able to play together once, but we did do okay. a show together, yeah. So we both have this uh one guy who does a, a podcast in Jackson, Mississippi, and he, he loves Rhino. Su- Rhino. Okay, yeah. you know Rhino. Yeah, he yeah. loves supporting artists. So we've become very good friends over the years and um Okay. You know, we're always talking about music whenever I go to his house to play. And he was just telling me how Kula is all about Creative Commons music and that I should check it out. Mm-hmm. So I did, and I, I checked out a couple of them and uploaded my music. And I'm always making just random songs too. So mm-hmm. it seemed like a good opportunity, even if I'm not going to release a song as like a John Worthy song on Spotify, I could release those, you know, for people to hear. So I started doing that. And then I've actually made pretty decent money on some of the sites over the years, which has been nice. Yeah. Um, I've been able to upload like hundreds of songs, you know, a lot of them just ones that I've never even released as, as hmm. John worthy. So, Oh, you released them just, under like a pseudonym. Well, they're on there, I guess is John worthy. Maybe I forget, um, okay. but I never release them out on like Spotify or YouTube or, gotcha. you know, the normal distribution sites. Right. Yeah. But it's, yeah, it's just a cool way to get some more music out there and maybe so, it will become someone's favorite song and. Um, and usually when I have had a few people reach out that have heard my music on there, if asking if they could use it in one of their videos and they're always pretty nice about offering a couple bucks in cash, you know, mm-hmm. even though it is typically for free. Yeah. No, a lot of people who do support the community usually are very open to supporting the artist as well. The problem being is over the years, what happened is, is, uh, people who actually just, churn out like here's a cartoony song here's an emotional song here's a cinematic song those type of people started releasing them under royalty free so it's harder to find actual artists that release under creative commons like even the sites that used to be very well curated they just get so much of it that it's like oh well this is just you know this is powerpoint presentation music you know like that that sort of stuff like they flood all of the places where the bands actually used to release their stuff under creative Commons, So it's getting harder and harder to find bands and musicians that do this stuff. Not that those people aren't musicians, but you know what I mean? Like people like you who actually tour and do stuff. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, But I was, yeah, I was curious to know if, uh, if you were doing that and I'd like the story of how that led up to it. And the fact that Rhino's involved, he's a great guy. He's actually the reason why I played the show in Milwaukee with Cullah because he, came to Milwaukee and set up a show. Was that last year? <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. It was two last, years ago now. Two years ago now. Two years I think. ago. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I actually talked to him about that show specifically. Um, oh, okay. I'm going, I'm going to his house in two weeks to play. Oh, you're doing um, that? Yeah. House show. And then uh, I'm playing a local venue there too. Oh, fun. Where are you playing at? Um, I think it's actually a small little bakery. I'm just playing solo. Um, okay on Friday and then I'll play it. I'll actually play at Rhino's house on Saturday. Nice. He'll, he'll live stream it and everything. So yeah, we still haven't had a chance to make it down to his house. We've talked about it in the past, but we haven't, we haven't done it yet. So yeah, that would be fun to do. Um, now you were saying that during the pandemic, you uh, downloaded Ableton and, and started, you know, finding things and recording and stuff like that. So you had not self recorded up to that point. That was your first time doing it. Right. Yeah. I'd always done kind of the traditional go into a a studio and have an engineer, you know, we tracked as a band, whoever I brought into the studio with me, like a bassist, a drummer, and we just track and and build the song that way. And then um, pretty much the last year and a half, I've now I'm exclusively just doing it all myself. Okay. I was going to ask that. Total 180. Yeah. All right. So how are you recording uh, drums and stuff like that? Do you have a regular kit? Are you programming them? Like, how are you doing drums and other instruments? Yeah, I do. I do all programming. Um, I have a couple of different softwares that I can pull actual drums that have been played by real drummers. And then I also just pull different samples for like more of the pop stuff. Um, And then, I I mean, my my opinion is that 99% of people don't pay attention necessarily to like how the drums sound or 
they just want a good feeling and a good vibe. Then say and, that to my drummer. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not, and it's not just drums. It's, it's everything no, in I know the song. You, you know, they just want like a good overall feel. They want the, they want the lyrics to be good. They want the melodies to be good. And if that all sounds okay, like, and it's a really good song, that's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not a gear nerd. I'm not a uh, engineer nerd. Like I'm just trying to make the best song in the way that I can do it the best and maybe I'm, I'm the engineers out there might hear something that's harsh to their ear but I don't really care because right. that's not your average music listener anyway so that's very true I've I, I've had so many conversations even just with my, with my wife where I'm fretting over the way something sounds or I will be I'll, I'll play it for her and listening with that you know that thing where you think it sounds fine and then you play it for somebody while you stand there playing it for them and you can hear it too and yeah. suddenly all of the embarrassing stuff comes out that you didn't notice before i'll i'll mention that after it and she's like i have no idea what you're talking yeah, about yeah exactly. it's like oh so it's really just me <laughs> yeah it's just like when you're playing on stage and you you screw up a little bit and then you, mm -hmm. you mention it to someone after they're like i didn't hear that at all it sounded great you know right because they're not they're not paying attention to those little things they're just trying to hear the song. And uh, I think when you make your own music, you get so attuned to little things here and there that you, you can't, it's hard not to fixate on them. Mm -hmm. So I think it's good to kind of have an open mind and just let the song be at, at times. And I think that's why I've been able to release so much music is because I'm, I'm mm -hmm. not super picky about that. Yeah. And the worst uh, thing that I just thought of is when you're working on a particular instrument, and especially if you're programming it or trying to get the right sound out of it, you're, you know, EQing and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then you go to listen back <clears throat> and you notice it's the only instrument that you can listen to right now. Like yeah. that's all that stands out is the, it, like you can't hear the rest of the song right. and then you're like, it's too loud. So you turn it down, but you don't realize that it's just, that's where your mind is focused. Anyway, I was just, yeah. that has nothing to do with anything. I was just thinking yeah. of that while you were talking. Um, and you also have a new album out right now called Barely Here. So was this self-recorded? I think six of the songs I did with someone else and then the rest were me. Okay. Um, so the way I do it now is I do all singles and then I kind of, I package. So I did 12 singles for this, from this album um, over the course of about two years. And then I packaged it all together as a a 17 song album. I was going to say, cause you've got a lot of songs on it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I think from a DIY independent perspective, it doesn't make sense to just release an album out into the world. And then once that's done, like you don't have anything else to get momentum from, and you're not even going to find that many people that will take the time to listen to an entire album unless mm -hmm. they're a huge fan. So I've, come to the conclusion that you might as well just do one song at a time mm -hmm. maybe each time you'll get a couple more people that will like that song and then they'll go and listen to the next one and so on and so on and then eventually you can just release it all as an album but i kind of just do as many singles as possible leaves you with stuff to post about every month or every couple months mm -hmm. um and just i think increases your opportunity to gain more fans and listeners yeah no, in the past, actually, it's been a little over a year now. Uh, last year in July, uh, I started doing the waterfall technique where yeah. you release a song, then you release another, but that song you released last month is the second track on it. And yeah. then, you know, and then you keep going and it keeps snowballing until suddenly it's like an entire album, but you've album, been releasing yeah. one, rolling out each song as you go along. Yeah. That it, it makes a lot of sense. And I still, my band is on board with this, but I do have um, two guys in the band that are very much like album purists. Like, yeah, I want to release albums and it's like, well, we're going to, <laughs> you know, right. We will be an album when year, we're done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so it is, it, that was the compromise because I was always like, let's just keep releasing singles. And truthfully, yeah. the waterfall technique, I really, liked that i think that makes a lot more sense just because the plays carry over right uh with the next release so i found that kind of interesting have you ever done releases like that or do you just do the singles i guess it all i mean what you're saying it, when i look at my album now it it has 
you know, all the songs that are over a thousand plays, it, they're that's right. how they're counted now. So I guess the distribution service I use does that automatically. Okay. Um, but I, but I, when I release the singles, it doesn't just go as track number two, then track number three. It mm -hmm. shows up as a separate single. And I also like to do different cover art for each song. Right. Too. So yeah, that's, too. A, you know, kind of an, it's like its own independent release, but then I just combine it into the album. Do you do your own cover artwork or do you have somebody that does that for you? No, that's usually something I, I do outsource. Um, okay. I do, I'll do a lot of pictures and then just find some local people that are decent at editing and putting font on there. Um, back, I, I do music full time now, so my budget isn't quite as big, but back when I had more income, I was able to kind of outsource to do like full artwork visions for certain songs if I wanted okay. that. Um, but now I'm kind of either doing like a photo shoot and then using some of those pictures and editing in, editing them in different ways or just coming up with um, easy ideas to use for cover art. Okay. And, and uh, hiring out the photo shoots and stuff like this, uh, you also put out videos. And I want to say uh, if they're the types of videos where the best way to put it is they look real. Uh, you know, they look like real music videos <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for lack of a better way of explaining it. They don't look like, uh, if I were to make one, it would be shot on an iPhone. Or even if we did like a production, it would be like, oh, that looks good. You guys yeah. did a good job. Yours looks like some company made it, yeah. you know, some company that makes music videos <laughs> made it or so. Yeah. So how do you go about making your videos? Cause you also have quite a few of them. Yeah. So tell me about your video making process. So it's kind of been split. I've been very fortunate in meeting super talented people that um, have just kind of been very receptive to my music and, and like me as a person and are willing to kind of just help me out either for, totally for free or just I kind of throw them a couple hundred bucks and they'll, you know, they're just so talented that they can make these amazing music videos. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, the the video for the song, Don't You Feel It? I don't know if you've seen that. It's probably my highest quality production one. Um, I, I got to play the Joker. Yeah, I was wondering and, if that was the one. Okay. Yeah, so my friend is a full-time videographer. He works in LA. He works in Atlanta. He handles like $100,000 cameras every day. And he also likes to make music videos and film projects on the side. So we had done one music video for one of my songs uh, a year prior. And um, and then he had this big vision for, for a music video. And so he sent me the outline and I literally just showed up in Birmingham, Alabama, where he lives um, the night oh, before. you even went out of town for it, okay. Yeah, yeah, I've done that a bunch actually. <laughs> okay. Just for music videos. And he had assembled a team of about 20 to 25 people to make this music video for me. Um, mm -hmm. we had a, we had a clown to do my makeup. We had a wardrobe stylist. <laughs> you got an actual had, clown to do your clown makeup. That's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> we had, um, a four person lighting team with a lighting truck full of equipment. We had like two or three producers slash gophers that were just like doing all this stuff back and forth. Um, two directors and then two camera people hmm. and he assembled all this and funded a lot of it himself. And we did like this Hollywood esque production for a whole day. And you can tell like the production of it, the quality of it's really pretty high. Yeah. Um, and that would have cost probably over 10 grand to make. And he barely charged me anything, which is so generous. And yeah. And he's also been able to use that and enter it into to film contests and stuff and kind of show people what he's capable of. So. Mm -hmm. um, so I've had that happen a number of times with different projects like that. Um, and then I've, I've also just been able to find a few people here in Nashville that are really good. And I've, I've paid them whatever their rate is to make some music videos too. So, okay. Huh. And when you went out to, uh, this other town to record the video, did you book some shows while you were out there or did you just I think, go? I, I think this was during COVID actually. Oh, okay. um, yeah. But I've, I've gone to Bemidji, Minnesota to shoot a music video. Hmm. 
Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm not even that familiar was, with that. Interesting. That was a super random one. Um, so I, I mean, I, yeah, I'll tell that story. So I had, I woke up to a, an email one morning from a guy who had found my song, please tell me. And he found it on a creative commons website. Mm -hmm. I think, I think it was uh, tribe of noise. Are you familiar okay. with that one? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they bought uh free music archive recently. Yeah. 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 So he found my song, please tell me. Um, and he loved it so much that he used it as the focus of his short film. He made the short film and then he emailed me after asking if he could use the song in his video. Hmm. So I think he was kind of going for the old, like better to ask for forgiveness than ask for, for permission thing. Right. But it, it was an awesome short film, really well done. And I said, yeah, man, I'm, I'm happy you found the song and I'm excited to see what, where this goes for you. And uh, he entered the short film into a, a Minnesota film festival and it ended up winning best original score. Oh, cool. And the only music in it was my song. So it was, they put my name on the award, which is cool. But anyways, we just really, he thought very highly of my music and I really liked his videos. So we kind of started talking and got the idea that uh, if I could fly out to Bemidji, Minnesota, where he lived, he'd be happy to just do this music video for me for free. Mm -hmm. So we made that happen. Um, I think it was 2021 and uh, we made a really cool music video. He had this crazy idea. I rode a horse for the first time. We got all these, it was a really small town. We got all these people in town involved in the video. And um, that's for my, my song waiting to see, you can see it on YouTube. Hmm. So yeah, I've been just kind of random meetings like that. I've, I've had a few videos made and um, it's really cool to get to work with other artists you know, and see how they interpret your, your own art. Yeah. No, we, we, <laughs> one of our songs got used in a, uh, in, in a, actually it may have been in Min Minnesota too. I wonder if it was the same festival, but we got used in one, but their, <laughs> their short film is about a guy that um, unwittingly becomes a photographer in a foot fetish <laughs> community. Oh man, nice. <laughs> It's a very strange movie. It's basically the concept is it's an old security guard who becomes obsessed with finding the perfect shoes for comfort because his feet always hurt. So he starts mm -hmm. taking pictures of feet, but he's taking pictures of shoes of people that walk into the gallery that he's the security guard of. And somebody catches him doing this and they think he's a foot fetishist and they basically hire him to take pictures of feet. It's a weird movie. Um, anyway, <laughs> that's that's our independent film. <laughs> I've had, this is a random side note, I haven't told many people this, but I've had um, some really interesting fans over the years that have taken it a little too far. And I had one person that saw a picture of my feet on Instagram <laughs> and reached out asking if they, if I, if they could have individual foot pictures of mine wow and that okay. they were even even willing to pay money um but you know but you've never... made it when that happens <laughs> <laughs> it never it never got to the point where it was worth it for me so i i, I declined <laughs> well keep an eye out for your I, only I fans in the yeah. future <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's awesome oh wow um, <laughs> when you're booking shows, um, do you book them yourselves? Do you have an agency that you go through? How are, how are you setting up shows? How are you finding them? Booking shows is like the worst possible yeah. thing in the world to do for me. Yeah. So how, what do you do? <laughs> that well, was a weird transition a, by the way, right? No, yeah, yeah, it worked. <laughs> you did it well though. I'm yeah. definitely in a season of, um, so I, I mean, I was so much on the road for a solid three to four years and I, I really burned myself out um, because I was doing all the booking, setting up all the shows, getting the local bands to play. Um, and mm -hmm. I just didn't think that the benefit that I got from it was really pushing my career forward in the way that I was hoping. Mm -hmm. um, it, I was starting to lose money on some runs um, and I just didn't feel like the shows were really what I had envisioned for myself after grinding for so many years. So yeah. I'm definitely in a, in, a, in a time where I'm not playing nearly as many as I used to. But when I was like at the peak of playing shows every weekend, pretty much going out of town all the time, I would usually reach out to 
a local band or two in the city. So I'd pick out a route, like Nashville's very central. So I'd pick out maybe um, Louisville, Kentucky on a Friday. And then from there, it's only an hour and a half to Cincinnati, Ohio. So I'd pick out my cities and then I'd look at music venues in each of those cities and see which bands had played there. Hmm. And then I'd reach out to maybe a handful of bands say, Hey, I'm thinking about coming to Louisville on July 16th. Would you be interested in playing with me? I'm going to reach out to these venues once I get a couple bands on board. And I would just okay. do that until I got, you know, a couple bands that would be willing to, to make a bill with me. Um, Cause I'm, I'm, I mean, kind of where the negativity set in for me is I never got to the point where I had a following in any of these cities, mm -hmm. but my mindset with trying to get local bands was maybe if I could get a couple bands to play with me, they'd bring their fans and then those fans would, you know, had latch onto my music. So right. that was kind of what I was hoping, but it just never really turned into what I was hoping. So, well, and it's um, hard to know what, that band's following is what they're yeah it's hard to know the history of that too you gotta you gotta start going deeper and deeper into layers to know right. that it's it's just right. an assumption which is on paper a great assumption going and then their fans will become my fans and like, yeah you know if, if you know lollipops and rainbows yeah of course they yeah. will <laughs> but there's more to it yeah yeah I mean, I, and i was able to play hundreds of shows and really hone my chops and had some awesome times on the road and um, I don't regret any of it, but it just got to the point where I was, you know, the shows were not great, just not playing to that many people. And then when you start to lose money, like pretty consistently with mm -hmm. paying the guys that you're, that are playing with you, paying for gas, um, the occasional hotel, you know, it just, it becomes kind of depressing. So I've kind of right. taken a step back from that and I'm reevaluating and just continuing to, to, to make music and um, just make more money doing the production thing for now. Okay. And then one, one last question for you. I, I meant to ask this earlier when I was talking about your new album, you also released the new album on vinyl. Um, mm -hmm. Did you, how did, how did you go about doing that? Did you do it just cause you wanted to, did you do a campaign for it? How did, how did that come about? Both. Yeah. I, I just kind of have always loved, going to a show and seeing the bands that have a vinyl record, like it's so just seems so legitimate to me. It, it's just so cool to have your music on something and you put it on the, the record player and it plays. Mm -hmm. So I've always wanted to do that. Um, and I, I had always made CDs, which is a very affordable option, but literally no one has CD players anymore at all. Right. And um, so it did kind of feel empty for, for a while there. I was just releasing music and only having the digital option seemed a little lame to me so i wanted to have a, a vinyl so yeah i did a crowdfunding campaign um last what summer what platform did you use indiegogo oh you did do indiegogo okay yeah. so i think they take the least amount of percentage okay. from what i from what i researched but yeah i did a indiegogo and um i mean honestly when you're pretty small artists most of the people that contribute are going to be ones that know you your friends family and um so i was lucky to have a lot of friends and family pitch in some really nice amounts rhino ended up being a a vip i kind of labeled out nice. like the different um contribution levels and he was one of the highest and then a couple other people gave some really nice contributions and so yeah so i was able to fund um a vinyl and do that whole process this year which was pretty complicated i didn't realize to make a vinyl that's what i'm always worried about yeah is yeah. the complication of it well and that and you went about it the smart way because you had people donate and contribute to it so you knew that there were a certain amount that were going to go to people whereas yeah. i could go make a vinyl album first of all it would sound like crap because i'd have to get it mixed for vinyl but yeah the just because I get it doesn't mean anybody's going to buy it. <laughs> yeah. Know? It's the not knowing what's going to happen next part. That's difficult. Yeah. So I think, doing it, would a be, campaign I think it would be a good investment just because it, I always think it looks really cool. Just like on your, your shelf or whatever, just a cool piece of art, you know, even if someone, right. Maybe they'll buy it for that reason. But yeah. I, um, what you said, mixing. So I, 
what I was told is it doesn't really need to be mixed for vinyl, but more so the mastering is, is right. a, yes. di- a whole different thing. You're right. So I, yeah. did, I had to have it remastered for vinyl by someone that does that, you know, mm-hmm. on a regular basis. So, um, but then I, I couldn't do, initially I had 12 songs in a specific order. Well, I wanted to do 15 on the vinyl, but I had to cut it down to 12 because you can mm-hmm. only do, I think, 22 minutes per side. Right. And then I had to cut it down to 12. And then the initial order I had it in, one, side A was going to be 23 or 24 minutes and side B was going to be 20. So that mm-hmm. was too long. So I had to reorganize the songs for it to make sense that they were both under 22 minutes. So mm-hmm. it's, it's in a slightly different order than the digital version and then it has five less songs too. Because you could never redo the digital order. <laughs> How are you yeah. ever going to rearrange the album on streaming? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's set for life. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. No, I, I, I'm glad I remembered to ask that because I really wanted to know about it. So that's super cool. And then um, if people wanted to check out some of your music, where could they go do that? Yeah, I always recommend you when know, we talked about music videos, I think that's a really good way to get to know an artist. If they mm-hmm. do have music videos, just to kind of see not only the, hear the music, but kind of hear, see the vision that they had for their song. So I always like pointing people to YouTube and just type in my name, John Worthy. I've, I think I've 13 music videos out and then i have one more coming out in a couple weeks for an older song so there's plenty of music videos to check out and then uh, obviously spotify apple music anywhere you can you get your music i'll be there and um yeah for your creative commons folks um i have music on tribe of noise and Jamendo. cool all right well i want to thank you so much for talking with me today this has been great Yeah, thank you so much, Tom. This is awesome.